Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me here this evening. I've got the lights out. There's actually no presentation. Um, well, there is one. Usually, the central bank prepares something, uh, which I never read. <laughs> uh, the, we have an understanding with the research department. Um, they write their paper because the central bank is always politically correct, but the governor isn't. Um, so um, this document I hold, if I get into trouble with the government, I show as evidence I was quoted out of context uh, or misunderstood or otherwise misrepresented. Okay. Um, I'd like to speak to you today from a very practical uh, perspective on our experience with the latest financial crisis our response to it, and what we see as the role of the reforms of the financial system to, in a developing economy. Um, the Nigerian banking system was in a big crisis in 2008, 2009, as you know. We were hit by the second round effects of the global financial crisis. Nigerian banks uh, were not in any way exposed to the subprime market. Um, they were not correlated to the international capital markets but we did have our own bubble. Uh, Nigeria is an economy where oil accounts for 10 to 12% of GDP, but 80% of government revenues, about 99% of export earnings, and therefore was responsible for a tremendous amount of liquidity in the capital market. As is typical with all resource-rich countries, when oil price went up to $147 a barrel, and we're producing over 2 million barrels a day, all that liquidity went into creating a bubble in the Nigerian capital market, and Nigerian banks took heavy bets, similar to the bets taken by banks in the US and Europe, um, funded by huge leverage. Some banks had 30, 40% of their portfolios directly or indirectly exposed to the capital market. Now, oil price crashed at one point to under $40 a barrel. That took out the liquidity from the system, uh, the bubble bust. Uh, the Nigerian capital market in 2007 was the world's best performing capital market. In 2009, it was the world's worst performing capital market. It tells you how big uh, that bubble was. Um, I was appointed governor of the central bank in mid-2009. At that time, the signs were already clear that there were serious issues that had not been addressed and that needed to be confronted. The crash in oil price led to a big rundown in reserves. The central bank had to devalue the currency of about 25% on one night in late 2008. Um, we had to adopt a number of quantitative easing measures. By the time I came in, liquidity ratios had been reduced significantly. Um, cash reserve requirements have been practically removed. Uh, banks had used up a lot of their uh, guilts and they were borrowing against um, weak collateral from the central bank in what is called an expanded discount window. But we're addressing symptoms and not the real cause. So the first thing we did in 2009 was to send in examiners to look at the banks. And we discovered that out of 24 Nigerian banks, Eight were in what we called in a grave situation. Uh, capital had been wiped out, largely due to exposures to the capital market and to all marketing. Um, there had been a lot of governance abuses, which we discovered later. Uh, in, case, in some cases, there was outright theft of deposits. Um, and we had to move in. So in August 2009, we removed the CEOs and executive directors of eight of 24 Nigerian banks. Uh, these banks accounted for 30% of total liabilities, 40% of total assets. And if they had gone down, the entire banking system would have collapsed. And this was a time when Nigerian banks did have subsidiaries across <coughs> Africa. So a major crisis in Nigeria would have been a major crisis in the sub-region as a whole. Having removed the management, and stepped, stepping into the banks, we discovered that the problem was not what we thought it was, it was actually worse. It wasn't just about banks taking exposures to the capital market, 
It wasn't just about people taking bad credit decisions, it wasn't just about risk management, that in a few cases, those loans were basically um, arrangements to steal money from the banks. That the management, in some cases, set up SPVs, approved loans to themselves effectively, and took the money and traded in the capital market, or took the money abroad and bought property. We've had a case of a chief executive officer who, by converting depositors' funds and pretending to be trading in the stock market, had acquired 200 pieces of real estate in the United Arab Emirates. Um, in addition to property in Johannesburg, <coughs> in addition to property on the Potomac, and four private jets. Um, you know, now we, in, in practical terms, and this is really where sometimes theory fails, it is very easy. And, and I, I started my life as a banker, so um, I know this, I've run a bank. It's very easy to run a bad bank for a very long time. If you have a deposit money bank, all that you need from day to day is to have enough liquidity to pay those customers that turn up on your counter 5% or 10% of your depositors. I mean, so long as they get their money every day, the bank is good. It's when you have a shock that you actually know which bank is strong and which bank is a shell. So you could very easily see institutions standing up and looking strong that are really empty shells. And this is what happened with the crisis with many of the banks all over the world that simply turned up to be empty shells, uh, filled with bad loans, with assets that were worthless, but which were not properly accounted for. So uh, we moved in and we discovered these cases of fraud. Uh, and I'm sure you probably are aware that uh, we as a country um, decided that we're not going to allow this and the central bank insisted on prosecutions. Uh, this particular CEO that I speak about uh, was put in jail uh, we have two more that are about to be convicted, hopefully, um, in the next uh, few weeks um, for similar offenses, not of the same magnitude, but of a similar, similar nature. People setting up SPVs and taking out money and buying property abroad or setting up a, a trusts um, abroad. We also um, insisted on a number of governance changes. So in Nigeria, for example, now, no CEO can remain in the same bank for longer than 10 years. After 10 years, you've got to go. We asked all those that spent 10 years to leave because we discovered that in most institutions, the chief executive officers that overstayed um, compromised the governance and risk management structures. And these are practical human behavioral issues. You're a CEO, um, you take a junior member of staff, promote him all the way to executive director, the checks and balances disappear. The chief risk officer was appointed by you. The auditor was appointed by you. Um, the um, shared gap in rank is such that the CEO becomes too powerful in the institution and he undermines the structure. So after 10 years, we tell them to go. After 10 years, the auditors um, have to be changed. After 12 years, every non-executive director has to leave to another institution. And we, by introducing this, we're able to change introduce changes in top management of banks and bring up uh, new management. But we then had to deal with the balance sheet issues, similar issues that have been dealt with in Europe today. We had a crisis of confidence, um, and to deal with that, we had to take those steps that we took, and the moment we removed the CEOs, the moment we said we were going to deal with this issue, the confidence started coming back, but we still had to deal with repairing the balance sheets of banks. And for this, the model we took uh, was a model that was applied in Malaysia after the Asian financial crisis. Uh, we set up an asset management corporation uh, that was designed to do the work of three institutions that were set up by Malaysia after the crisis. The Dana Harta, the Dana Modal, and a debt restructuring desk. Uh, the first had the task of purchasing non-performing loans from banks at a discount. The second had the task of injecting capital um, into banks 
um, that needed capital after the purchase of non-performing loans. And the third had the job of restructuring um, the corporate debt uh, so that it could be paid. Uh, we set up one vehicle that could do that and then put up the banks for sale. So eight of those banks uh, were put up. Uh, we had a bid, we had a process where investors came in. Uh, five of them were able to get into some form of merger or acquisition arrangement. Uh, three of them ended up being nationalized and they're going to be sold um, in the next few weeks. But by September 30, we had recapitalized the banks. Uh, now what Amcon did was to issue bonds guaranteed by the Federal Ministry of Finance, which were then accepted by us for liquidity. Um, and those bonds are going to be redeemed over a 10 to 12 year period. But the unique thing about the Nigerian resolution is that the Nigerian banking system itself is going to pay for the bailout. So from this year, every Nigerian bank is going to set aside a certain percentage of its total assets into a sinking fund and the banks themselves are going to pay for the cost of the bailout. Um, and this is the way we've addressed the issue of who pays uh, for the bailout. I know there's a whole debate over here about um, who should pay, should the taxpayer pay, should banks pay bonuses. Um, we settled that issue by asking our own banks to pay for the bailout and, uh, and they've agreed uh, very kindly and generously uh, to, uh, to do so. Now, Now this is basically a, a brief um, of what happened um, in 2009, uh, 2010. But what I'd like to speak about today is what really um, is the long-term solution to these crises? You can't avoid them, obviously, um, and you can't um, run away from crisis um, in a capitalist system. If you look at what happened in Europe and America, if you look at what happened in Nigeria, at the heart of the crisis, in my view, is the total disconnect between the balance sheet of banks and the real economy. Um, banking started, um, or the financial system um, started initially as an intermediary with the objective of gathering all the long-term savings in the economy and channeling that through maturity transformation into real <coughs> investment into the production of real goods and services and the creation of jobs. Over time, and in the last 10, 20 years in particular, um, that seems to have changed. And the banks have ended up taking these savings and betting against asset prices, the capital market or the real estate. And the problem with that is you get into this um, trap that, that, that you find when you have what's called the big four theory. As they say, the stock market operates on the basis of the, of the big four theory. You buy, uh, you buy a share at 20 pounds, and you hope that a bigger <coughs> fool will buy it at 25 pounds. And he buys thinking a bigger fool will buy at 30 pounds, until you get to the biggest fool who buys at 40, and finds that nobody's going to pay more than 40 for it. And then um, it crashes, which is fine. I mean, if you want to bet and take that risk with your money, it's fine. But it's not the kind of risk that depositors expect their banks to take. And it was therefore important uh, for us in the central bank to put a stop to it and to create structures that would totally ring fence, depositors fence from that kind of activity. And that therefore, something similar to what the Vickers report anticipated, we had to break up the banks uh, and uh, reverse this universal banking model and ring fence retail banks and separate that from investment banking and speculative activity. But beyond that, uh, we had to think about how strategically we could change the entire DNA of the Nigerian banking system. And we started a process um, of what was called the Bankers Committee Retreat. We do have a Bankers Committee like everywhere else where you have the governor of the central bank and the deputy governors um, and the CEOs of all the banks meeting once every two months, in some places once a quarter, in some places once a month. We meet once every two months. Um, and we decided um, that there was a need for us to ask ourselves in 2009 what kind of banking industry we want to build on the ashes of the old banking industry. 
how do we get the banks to lend to the real economy? And here we come to the real challenge of the role of finance in the real economy. Now, Nigeria is an economy that has grown at 7% per annum on the average in the last decade. Uh, we're an oil producing country, 13% uh, of GDP is oil. However, um, if you looked at the papers in the last week or so, given the numbers, 90% of Nigerians live on less than a dollar a day. Um, and why is that? Why can't we have inclusive growth? And this is a problem that you find in Nigeria, it's a problem you find in many African countries. And at the heart of it is a structural problem. Uh, for those of you who students of economics, it comes down to linkages and externalities. Uh, Nigeria is a country that produces crude oil, but imports refined petroleum products. We have a large cotton belt, and we import our textiles from China. We're the world's number one producer of cassava. We don't produce starch. We don't produce ethanol. Nigeria has tomato, produced tomato locally, but we import tomato puree and tomato paste. Um, Morocco exports tomato to, um, to Europe. We import tomato from China. Um, you know, so everywhere you go um, across the Nigerian economy, you have broken value chains. 70% of the population is rural, living um, on agriculture. Agriculture is primary production. Yields um, are 1.8 metric tons per hectare, much less than half of the global average. In other parts of Africa, in some parts of East Africa, you have yields as high as seven, eight metric tons per hectare. So the banking industry is unable to lend to the real economy precisely because the real economy is totally broken. How do you lend to a tomato farmer if 40% of his output is going to perish between the farm and the market? There's no investment in storage. There's no investment in cold rooms. There's no electricity. The country generates 4,000 megawatts of electricity, which is less than is generated by Ethiopia, uh, and just slightly more than uh, is generated by Togo. 4,000 megawatts of electricity for a population of 167 million people. Uh, why? Uh, because there is a whole group of vested interests that makes a lot of money from importing generators and diesel. So Nigeria is the world's biggest importer of electric generators. It's a very big business. So why, why provide light when you can make money um, importing generators? Uh, why, uh, why fix refineries when you can make money from fuel subsidies importing petroleum products? And it's become so you've got a typical rentier state where um, you have what's called the resource course, um, where, where all the, um, uh, the resource curse, where all the um, revenues go to the federal government, and then you've got all these um, rent-seeking um, elite that have perpetuated these inefficiencies in the system. And as a result of that, um, you can't find viable agricultural projects to lend to. Even though agriculture is 42% of GDP, it's all subsistence agriculture. You can't find viable manufacturers to lend to because of the huge infrastructure deficits. If you want to set up a textiles factory today in Nigeria, um, unless power is fixed, you've got to provide your own power, you've got to provide your own security, you've got to provide your own infrastructure. So you have a situation in which you're not just a manufacturer, you are your own power plant, you are your own security company, you are your own logistics provider. And the result is that SMEs manufacturing tend to be commercially unviable unless you have a lot of capital. So the large multinational corporations make a lot of money, um, the small uh, companies are unable um, to borrow. So the great challenge we've had in the last two years was how do we impact on the wider environment? How do we um, push through the structural adjustment that is required to open up those avenues um, for bank lending? And uh, we focused on three critical areas. Uh, we've been working um, as a banking industry with the government on power reforms, on the privatization of the power sector, on the review of the tariffs, and we've been able to move that forward. 
uh, but the greatest progress has come in agriculture, where we have finally gotten to a point where the government recognizes the need um, to stop focusing on these exports of primary products and focus on building agriculture and agro-allied businesses. Um, Nigeria needs to see China uh, in some cases as competition. Nigeria needs to look at industries that can take away from China. Many of the light manufacturing industries uh, from textiles to starch and basic industries um, are now uncompetitive where the Chinese are concerned given the very high levels of wage labor in China um, over the last um, two, three decades. So the focus of the Nigerian economy at the moment is how to fix those value chains and then how do you get the banks to lend um, to those value chains? Because without that, um, I have no doubt in my mind that in the four or five years, you'll be back exactly where you are. If banks can't lend to agriculture, if banks can't lend to manufacturing, if banks can't lend to petrochemicals industries, all that money is going to go back uh, into the stock market or into the real estate uh, market um, in one way um, or the other. So the focus of our reform in the banking industry has been to contribute to that um, new paradigm, sh that paradigm shift as far as the economy is concerned, and to integrate into that two major issues. The first is sustainability, uh, looking at the environment. The Nigerian banking industry has, decided, has basically focused on um, environmental issues now, the equator principles, uh, lending to all companies that, that meet minimum environmental standards. Also, um, the second is financial inclusion. 46% of the Nigerian population um, at the moment is underbanked or totally unbanked. Uh, we've worked on transforming the payment system, but we're looking at payment system transformation that is tied to economic development. So um, I'll give an example. We're doing mobile banking. Now, in most places, mobile banking just provides an opportunity for people to move money uh, from uh, friends to friends or to relatives. What we're doing with the banking industry is seeing how we can link the mobile banking innovations with development and poverty alleviation. I'll give you a simple example, antenatal care. In most of Africa, you have women that die at childbirth because they don't have access to antenatal care. They cannot afford to go to the next a clinic, they cannot afford to go for regular care, they cannot afford to go to hospital to have children. Now what we're doing is seeing how we can partner with NGOs so that a rural woman who gets pregnant can get an alert on her mobile phone to go to a clinic, use that voucher to pay for antenatal care and to also get money for food and transportation to and fro and make sure that every month she goes for that treatment. And at the end of the day, get an alert where she can go and have a baby in a hospital with some money given to her to take care of the baby. NGOs do that. Now, if we're able to do that effectively across rural areas, that leads to a reduction in maternal death. It leads to a reduction in, um, child, in, in, in infant mortality. And that is a major problem um, in most developing economies. So the integration of development and poverty concerns into the banking reforms has been for us a major, um, a, a major driver uh, of policy. The second area is women. We talk about the bottom of the pyramid. And all the time we speak about Africa, we talk about the poorest men and talk about them being at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, but under the feet and underneath the poorest of men, there's usually a very poor woman. You've got uh, women in Africa that simply, they, 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 you've got silenced voices, and the level of poverty among women is twice that among men. So um, part of what we've done in banking reform is to focus on women and to start by women in the banking industry itself. If you look at the banking industry, um, typically at very junior levels, the, there's a gender balance. As you move to middle and top management, there's a very high rate of attrition for women. And therefore, policies in banking, policies on financial inclusion, do not consider gender. Uh, what we've done, 
um, in the last one week, for example, is to arrive at um, a decision with bank CEOs. And we've agreed that 40% of top management position in Nigerian banks have to be kept for women. And at least 30% of the board seats by 2014 will have to be occupied by women. And the whole idea is to get the banks to focus on the question of financial inclusion for women. We've done things like non-interest banking uh, to look at those who are excluded uh, from the system for religious reasons. We've had our first Islamic bank license and it has started um, operations. Um, we're going to take, um, I suppose, uh, about 10 or 20 minutes of Q&A. What I'll do is just wrap up um, on the macro issues in about 30 seconds and then take from you what areas you'd like um, um, to hear me address. Um, a, a major fallout of the crisis um, all over the world is the fiscal crisis. Uh, we also have those challenges uh, of government spending, of huge government debts, um, and that has been a major factor fueling inflation. We've had to have tight monetary policy, uh, which has raised interest rates. Uh, we're fortunate in Nigeria in the last one year to have had a new finance minister in Gozio Konjirela, who is also concerned about fiscal consolidation. And the budget this year looks better than what it's been in the last two years. But a major problem we had in the last two years was dealing with the banking crisis at a time when we had an overly expansionary uh, fiscal stance. Um, that is getting under control. Uh, we've brought inflation down to 10.3%. Uh, we're aiming for single digits. Uh, exchange rates have been fairly stable. Reserves have finally started building up uh, in 2011. And we are, at this moment, focused um, on maintaining that stability while we push through these initiatives for growth. Um, that sums up what you'll find um, in this paper. There's a whole um, series of discussions of policies and initiatives that have been taken in response to the crisis. Uh, but I do hope I've tried to summarize um, those issues and I'll wait for Q&A.